Welcome back, everybody. It is August 13th, 1862, and we are back here with the Department of Missouri and the Army of Tennessee and various other forces active in the Western theater of the United States Civil War. So, back when we last saw each other, I was attempting to make a move down to Vicksburg, and as you can see, I am, I can go nowhere without trotting underfoot some other rebel armies. There are four or five sort of swarming this little column that's heading down toward Vicksburg. And I'm playing some time a little bit because we have less than two or just a bit, just about two days until we're going to make some major changes as a result of our uh, emancipation policy. Um, so at the moment, uh, I'm mostly waiting for the rebels to make a move. Um, if you imagine, if this looks crowded, you should see the east you should uh we might go and take a look in a minute but it is uh man this is what i would call a mess this is uh one of the things i hope developers are working on in terms of sort of balancing the ai and and making things a little bit more of a challenge i guess would be that if the rebels or the opponent whoever whoever you happen to be playing the opponent if they have, like, dozens of tiny armies, like, look at this, Army of West Tennessee, this is one of the bigger ones, 19,000 men. Hey, check this out. What great timing. Black men meeting uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln in the White House, and just about a day before uh, I'm going to actually make emancipation a policy of the United States. In any case, what I was saying was, one of the things I'd really like to see is the willingness for the AI to reform and consolidate armies because this the army of west tennessee 19,000 going up to 21,000 is pretty dangerous but the missouri state guard not so much they want to be 16,000 and right now they're 2700 stone's army 5500 army of east tennessee uh, 23,000 that's pretty big right but imagine if if this was all if all of these were connected to a single core moving in unison rather than just being spread all around you know, the state of, I guess this is still Tennessee. I <laughs> turned off the map borders. Here we go. Right? Spread out all around Tennessee. Spread out all around Mississippi. There's, it's just, it's uncoordinated. It's non-threatening. It's not something that I really have to worry about. I can just bounce these armies away whenever they get close. And so, so this does look dangerous. I do need to move down and punt the Missouri State Guard away a little bit. Because if... I allow them to recruit up to 16,000, and I have the, the 21,000 men of the Army of Tennessee here, that could be a position that I don't want to be in. So I do want to bounce them out. And hopefully I do that before they actually... Okay, no. So the Army of West Tennessee is just going to come at me. So I guess we're going to go play the battle. Army of West Tennessee under John Bell Hood. Strength of 19,047 guns. And it looks like we are on one of my favorite, favorite types of map. A horrible jungle map. So let's see if we can cheese, do our cheese scouting a little bit and see if we can locate the enemy. They've got a rather ponderous marching route. I guess that road ends. So it's unlikely they're going to be trying to come down to Bishop's Ridge. It'd be sweet if they did. This is a, actually a really nice little defensive area. Um, but um, they are likely going to come down this road, hit Ward's Ridge, and then turn down whatever road, this, this unnamed road here, to come down to Tucker. Just, just Tucker, apparently. That's it. Tucker, Tucker what? Tucker Swamp? There's no house. Is that just the name of the swamp? Um, I suppose they could also make this longer march down this way, because they are coming to this victory point. Either way, I essentially have, apart from this bizarre spur, it's mostly, I think, because I had the, the, they both deployed. I had a deployment over here and a deployment over here, and it sort of generated circles based on that. Anyway... Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 
Grant's divisions. And I'm going to hurl them over this way. All right, that's Kearney. Yeah. Kearney's, uh, Kearney's core is going to sit over here, and I'm going to take Grant, and I'm going to position him here, and the idea will be I'm going to sort of straddle these two lines here, and I'm going to keep you know one division ready to reinforce the other. I'm also very likely in the near future, um, probably as a consequence of the reorganization that will be brought on by the Emancipation Proclamation. I'm going to fire McClellan. Um, I might have some different uh, cavalry uh, personalities in theater because what I'm going to do after this battle, and I'll tell you again after the battle, is organize a larger, an independent cavalry corps that I'm going to organize as a raiding force. That I'm, I, I like I was I was talking about it a couple episodes ago. I want to send a uh, a strong cavalry raiding force up to Chattanooga, uh, and I want to see if I can torch those Confederate iron mines. We'll see. Uh, I might not do it. I might have to change my plans. But I I also think that a sort of deep raid into Confederate territory might also pull some Confederate armies away, and it'll help me zip on over to Vicksburg. Which is sort of what happened historically, um, and I, I'm I'm tempted. I might even put Ben Grierson in charge of that little force, as happened historically. But let's get the battle started. Let's get some scouting going. I would be surprised if the Rebs are a little close, so I'm going to be a little cautious as I uh, as I move around here. Enemy withdrawing. I would really like it if the AI stopped doing that. Don't offer battle if you're just going to withdraw as soon as you get in. Because it's just a giant waste of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Victory, sure. Alright. Let's get this moving. They are moving away. Uh, we already got this one. <laughs> uh, and I believe... Yeah, I was taking Grant down to punt away the Missouri State Guard. Stone's army keeps getting bounced. And if it wasn't for the readiness of Andrews here, uh, I'm going to move him to Memphis. I think Memphis will, will help uh, restock his goods here. Irvin McDowell has a perk. And now McDowell has this whole core. I mean, McDowell technically is the guy overseeing all of Missouri. So I want him to be headquartered mostly in Cairo. And I want his, his subsidiary core to be not too far away from Missouri, because the Sech still have some forces active that can come up and mess around here in Missouri. And I don't want that to happen. And I've got all these other corps operating in sort of deeper elsewhere, right? So I gotta be cautious in how I move them around, because I don't want to leave Missouri wide open. But I also, I want to limit the number of men that I'm sort of pouring into this region and the problem is as you can see it's sort of like i don't even know how to describe it right like the farther i go down this way the more open this country is and because i'm just pushing these army like you can see stone's army here is just bouncing back and forth off of my core it's panicking Right? It can't even withdraw because it just keeps bouncing off Andrew's core. Um, and we have a ton of armies that are just doing that. And they're just floating around, sort of getting bounced up and down. And they're not actually able to do anything because their morale is so low. And the enemy AI will not let them just stop and recover. And so what we're going to have is, as soon as I push past th these areas... I'm just going to have rebel armies that are just going to fill in in between and we have to go up and beat them and they're going to withdraw over to the sides and do it again. 
So without having to recruit another 100,000 men just to sort of guard, you know, the areas that we were trying to take, the, the sort of areas in between the cities that we're trying to take, you know, it's, it's, it's going to take lots of movement and lots of sort of fine control. So all of this is to say McDowell has a perk. And I think field telegraph seemed to help. And I think that's what I'm going to pick. <laughs> right. And I think that makes sense for a core or for an army headquarters, especially an army headquarters. that's operating. It's at such a distance from many of its other, many of its core. Right. So that's what I'm going to do. That's, the field telegraph is what I'm taking here. Um, and yeah, we'll get Andrews to go have some food. And still have to wait several days for a lot of our recruits to arrive in theater. I'm tempted to go after the Army of West Tennessee, even with just one core. Just because I, I'd really like it to just move, to just get away, to just get out of my way. <laughs> um, all right, one other quick update to let you know before we deal with the fallout from the Emancipation. So that'll be tomorrow, August 16th. It's just missing my birthday. Uh, but it is Yoki Meyer's birthday. And it's my nephew's birthday. Um, and if you don't know who Yoki Meyer is, uh, ask me and I'll probably explain at length. Anyway, um, I am building a new squadron, the Missouri Squadron. The Missouri Squadron, these were all fourth rate steamers that I captured from the Confederates. And I've renamed them. I've renamed them sometimes goofy names like the USS Helvetica. <laughs> Um, but, uh, they had even weirder names when they were in the Confederate hands. So, you know, don't worry about it. Um, and I, I'm sort of reorganizing some of the naval aspects because if we zip down here along the Mississippi, as we discussed a few episodes ago, we now have a few squadrons that are active down here in attempting to blockade and disrupt rebel, uh, ports. Uh, as much as we can. And if we look here, the blockade status, 39% blockade of New Orleans. And at some point, what I'm going to try to do is see if I can bombard some of these forts. Now, these are tough forts. These are super duper tough forts. So I'm not sure that even my steam squadron will be able to do much against them. If I can find an isolated sort of single single level fort something like this i don't think i can hit this from the from the land though or from from the sea rather so what i'd like to do yeah is find some isolated yeah level one forts here fort livingston that i can hit from the sea and bombard the living crap out of them so that i can get some experience up for the steam squadron and I'm curious to see if the game models any of the elements of sort of steam bombardment that were used in the Civil War. I haven't done enough naval stuff to know if it does or not. But we do know that historically, Farragut was able to basically sail up and capture New Orleans with just the fleet without ever even having to use the army. Uh, so it'd be rad if I could do that. And I've specifically assembled the steam squadron here for that particular purpose. What I know so far, what I know from my experience playing this game so far, is that it's the firepower aspect that really makes a big difference in how you're able to bombard forts. Uh, but again, I'm not sure exactly what these other elements do, right? So like, we can look at, there's commander's influence, they have average weapons range, the rate of fire, and the weapon's strength. And that changes depending on the squadron. Um, but I'm not a hundred percent sure if the tactical elements of bombarding forts from steam squadrons, uh, is modeled at all. I'm, I'm, I'm really not sure. 
Um, and I'm going to let you into a couple of other secrets here. I'm going to try. Most of this is going to be off camera, but as soon as it gets wherever it might go, I'm going to reveal a plan that I have. What I'm going to try to do is get sail some federal forces to build a supply depot in the Florida Keys. And if I can base a Marine contingent in the Florida Keys, I might be able to use that to make some more amphibious operations along the Gulf Coast. Say if I capture Tampa or maybe Appalachia or Appalachicola, I might be able to use that as a base to get more men to threaten New Orleans from the sea, which would be a neat thing to do. And I've never tried it, so I have no idea if it'll work, but it's something I'm going to attempt as I continue to attempt the Anaconda plan as it is. So let's get, um, let's get time moving. Uh, and again, we have the same thing that just happened. And I'm going to make a bet right now. They're not going to fight. They're going to withdraw. Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. If I get this deployment zone. Ah, boo. I was hoping they'd be lined up right here. Oh, they are. Cool. Okay. We might actually get some fight. And here's another thing that I find amusing about this game. You remember that I have not moved this army at all. It's just been sitting there. And now it is on a different map in a different strategic position against the same enemy army and everything else. I don't I don't understand sometimes why the game does what it does. I genu genuinely, genuinely don't. It is a mystery that would confound religious scholars. Um, but what I'm going to do is deploy Kearney. Uh, I'm also, while I deploy, you listen to me ramble, um, I'm having a, a, a crisis of pronunciation. So I'm listening to an audio book about the Civil War, which probably shouldn't surprise anybody, um, as we speak. It's about the Peninsula Campaign. It's uh, Steve Sears, Stephen Sears. A uh, book about the Peninsula Campaign, and Phil Kearney uh, is involved heavily in the Peninsula Campaign, and the audiobook narrator, who pronounces uh, UJ properly, uh, pronounces Kearney's name as Carney, not Kearney, and that's just making me paranoid that I've been mispronouncing Phil Carney's name this whole time. So I, I don't know. I don't know. But if you know, let me know. Uh, and right now we're just going to start because I don't have much to do. I still, man, I need to be reminded to get better artillery for this army. But I put all my artillery in. Okay, there we go. Yeah, they're retreating again. I wonder if that's a consequence of the fact that I that I went from 1.06 to 1.07 in this campaign. I wonder if that might be contributing to this. Yeah. Victory at Grenada. All right, let's run time. Uh, glorious victory at Fort Washington. Thank you for hurling me all the way across the screen. Um, so, all right, I'm going to give you a very brief preview. This has been happening over and over and over again since I left the peninsula. Just the spam army attacks over and over and over against my heavily garrisoned, reinforced Fort Washington. All they have been doing is hurling armies at my fort. And there's nothing I can do to stop it. I keep beating up their armies, and they keep sending them back again, over and over and over again. Sort of similar to what's happening here, except that they are withdrawing instead of actually getting sucked into an attack. It's, uh... uh it's... It's one of those things that sort of takes you out of the game. You know what I mean? Again, if they... If the enemy AI had any... Any ability to just take a breather, reconsolidate their troops, get them back up to ready, they'd be so much more dangerous and so much more threatening. But as it is, 
I don't have to do anything. I can basically automate my defenses back east because they're just going to go for that one fort recklessly, suicidally every time and get their asses kicked over and over and over again. And it's it's too bad because so much of this so much of this game is so interesting and so unique and so awesome, right? It's so great. And then there're just some of some of the things that are just like what are you thinking? Like come on. Anyway, We've got only a few hours, basically, until the Emancipation Proclamation drops. There we go. Lincoln emancipates the slaves. All slaves from secessionist states are free. Government support in free states soars. Europeans in favor of emancipation. So, yeah, this is the long-awaited Emancipation Proclamation. So, as we take a look at it, this, it basically, you know, it, it in in the fiction of the game, it convinces Europeans that the the Union is fighting for emancipation and slavery and the support for an intervention on behalf of the Southern states drops. Um, it increases support in the Union by plus five, which is good, and it increases relations with Europe by plus twenty. So more importantly, this track also enables us to research two more acts. The first one is U.S. color troops, which increases the whole, the total available of volunteer recruits by plus 10%, and it allows us to recruit individual brigades of, of black troops, which is awesome. Um, and it also allows us, once we get into Chapter 3, which is locked, I believe... I've never been sure if it's if chapter three unlocks as a result of the number of casualties taken in the war or if it's time locked. And I will tell you right now, I very seldom have campaigns that last much past mid-1862. Um, in this one, I'm, tr I'm, I'm trying. I'm being gentle against the Rebs because I don't want to just obliterate them. And that's leading to some of these problems, I think. Um, but I'm instantly going to research, research U.S. colored troops. Absolutely. I definitely want some in my army. And we're well past, uh, I believe we're well past time where colored troops were actually being used in Kansas and in the Western Theater anyway. So although the 54th Massachusetts is the, uh, the regiment that often gets credited as being the first sort of Union black troops to see combat. It was the first colored Kansas volunteers or the first Kansas colored volunteers uh, that actually fought for the first time uh, uniformed as uniformed Union troops that were raised in Kansas. And uh, so I'd like to get some brigades of, of black troopers in, in the theater as well as quickly as I can. So I'm instantly researching U.S. colored troops um, and we're going to get some... Uh, we're going to get some contraband troops in our army. It's going to be, it's going to be cool. Um, all right. So that's a big thing. Now I'm going to, I'm going to let you watch this next part because it has some relevance to, uh, you know, campaign stuff, even though we're concentrating on the West stuff that happens back East has an influence on it. Right? So earlier we saw, let's see again, they're, they're withdrawing because they lost that siege. So I gotta find the Army of the Potomac. The Army of the Potomac is still under the command of George McClellan. And when we looked at McClellan earlier in this campaign, he was the most famous general in the Union. He still might be. Um, okay, and he still does have, let's see if I run time a little bit. Let's get until at least tomorrow morning. All right. Okay, so he still has that policies slash objectives 50% increase to his fame. And I'm not 100% sure what that was because I assumed what that would be related to is the fact that the United States does not have an emancipatory policy. Because historically, George McClellan, I've said this a few times before already in, in this campaign and in the, the uh, Peninsula campaign videos I've been doing, 
Uh, McClellan was a Democrat and had no sympathy for abolition at all. And he was actually pretty pissed off. He thought it was like a, a personal attack on him when Lincoln released the Emancipation Proclamation following the Battle of Antietam. And McClellan, this is one of the things that led to McClellan's ouster, his replacement. I'm going to replace him right now because I don't want a Democrat in charge of my army <laughs> who doesn't believe in the cause, right? Um, so I'm going to have to do some personnel shuffling because I have to figure out who I want in charge of the Army of the Potomac. And I have a few possibilities, right? So I don't want to do Fitz John Porter because he's McClellan's toady and I'm probably going to replace him too. The same with William Franklin. These three are all in cahoots. They're all friends of McClellan. I'm getting rid of, I'm getting rid of them all. Patterson's okay. Cadwallader's okay. Um, we've got some pretty talented brigadiers. Uh, not so much in the, the Army of the Potomac, apparently. Uh, Don Carlos Buell is pretty good, although his initiative sucks. Uh, okay, but the Army of the Potomac isn't the army that's been doing most of the fighting. It's the Army of the Shenandoah that's been doing most of the fighting. And they're still recovering from their disaster in the peninsula. But Wilcox is a superb commander. He's legendary. Um, and he's up here in legendary, and he doesn't have a plus 50% increase to his fame. So I believe what I'm going to do is I'm going to put Wilcox in charge of the Army of the Potomac. I'm going to uh, raise Sherman up to be in charge of the Army of the Shenandoah. And I'm going to do some personnel shifting because all, almost all of my division commanders and even some of my brigadier generals here uh, are just absolutely knocking it out of the park. Some of these guys are just unreal. Look, look at look at David Gregg. Look at this guy. He's he's terrific. So, yeah. So I I don't I'm not going to belabor this. I want to. Um, I want to get some things reorganized and shifted around. Uh, so I will just, I'll do that off camera and I'll sort of review what I've done in, in a few minutes. So let's, uh, let's get to it. Okay, so I might make some other changes in a little bit, but for now, let me go survey for you some of the changes that I've made. Uh, to this theater. So, first we have a brand new core, the 20th Corps. Uh, Alright, so under George Thomas, I've taken the Army of Kentucky, I've made George Thomas, uh, I've made this an army. Now, Thomas is still in charge of what's basically the 15th Corps. So I have Dan Tyler as a division commander, and I've promoted uh, John Abercrombie as his second division commander. I have also removed the division of cavalry, uh, and I've put it under, I believe it was under McLaren already. Uh, and I've moved that to a brand new division. Um, I've also added a unit of infantry. So we basically got my divisions I'm trying to make, my infantry divisions, I'm trying to make generally kind of uniform. Three divisions of infantry, or three brigades of infantry and a, and a battery or battalion of artillery. So each division of infantry should be more or less like that, right? I also took... Hooker's 10th Corps, and I transferred it from the Army of the Shenandoah to the Army of Kentucky. So I've got Hooker now as my uh, 10th Corps commander under Thomas, and he's got two divisions of infantry, uh, each with an uh, attached battalion of artillery. All of these officers are pretty good. Some of them are excellent, but we're probably still going to have leadership problems, and I'll go into that in a moment. But I've also created the 20th Corps, this is an independent uh, division, an uh, independent corps of cavalry alone. These guys are going to be my scouts and my raiders. So as soon as Bryce shows up in 16 days, uh, these guys are still transferring over from uh, back east. And as soon as they arrive, we're going to start getting up to some shenanigans here. So the 10th Corps, even though it's been transferred to the leadership of the Department of the West here, I actually have to get it moving. So first, I'm going to bring him back to the railhead at... Um, what would be the easiest way to get here? Watch me as I look at maps. If I get him up to Philadelphia, he can take the rails basically all the way down to Cincinnati. And from Cincinnati, he can ride the rails down to Nashville. So that's what I'm going to do. 
So I'll have the 10th Corps take the rail up to Philadelphia. Um, yeah, so I'll wait until he arrives. So he's it's going to take him a long time to get his orders because, again, he's getting his orders from George Thomas, who now has to... Imagine being that courier, right? <laughs> you have to go all the way over here to Manassas uh, to give Hooker the orders to transfer on over. Uh, is what it is. But my independent cavalry corps, uh, I've just shifted it back here. I'm going to use that as a scouting and raiding force, and we'll hopefully see it in action pretty soon. Uh, now over here, the Army of Tennessee, I've made very few changes. Um, I'm, I'm likely going to try to shift things around. Um, I might actually... while I'm here. Hmm. I still don't have enough uh, spare good artillery to really upgrade much of the artillery arm of either of these armies. Uh, and I'm going to leave it for now. Huh. No, I am. I am. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to add a new division on <laughs> George McClellan. Uh, look at that. So again, he's still got that plus 50% fame rating, and I'm not I'm not sure where that's going to come from. Um, but yeah, so, alright. I'm going to replace Buford. We can, we can all watch this in real time. I'm sure all of you right now are, are just, just loving it. <laughs> Put Winfield Scott in charge of a uh, cavalry arm, huh? Well, so here's a trick. So for right now, I'm just going to put Heckman in charge um, of this third division of cavalry here because I want to replace McClellan with Buford as the corps commander. And I'm going to transfer Heckman and I'm going to transfer Wallace uh, to be under Buford's, Buford's overall command. I know Buford was Army of the Potomac guy and whatever, but he's over here now. Um, and eventually I'd like to recruit a few more brigades of cavalry and have them as at least six, you know, two divisions of three brigades of cavalry uh, over here. And I want to try to make this a bit more uniform too. I'm not really sure what to do with this third division. Whether I should put two more brigades of infantry in here and have Grant's sort of mega infantry corps or not. I'm not really sure. In any case, Buford should never be far enough away. And this will be the 21st Corps. Buford sh should never be far enough away that his cavalry can't come in to reinforce. But the only, the biggest issue is going to be that if I use the Cavalry Corps as a scouting force, when you put a, a unit in one of its army orders, it's got guard, raid, scout, when you put them in any of those things, other than just its sort of normal, you know, nondescript army orders, it takes a lot longer for them to reinforce. So that's something to watch out for um, as as we go on. But it's not something I have to super concern myself with right now. One thing I would like to take a look at uh, once I'm going to zip things along and... Okay. We're going to get into another battle another battle with the Army of West Tennessee when they're not going to do anything. Uh, okay, so this is pretty beautiful for now. Um, and let's see. We've got, yeah, Buford's, Buford's Corps is definitely not, not ready to arrive. Seven hours expected to arrive from the south. Uh, he's still got some time to, uh, to get his shit together, let's say. So, I doubt... That I'm actually going, that any of this is actually, I doubt they're going to do anything but immediately withdraw. But uh, I want to take the opportunity, if I can, to beat up on them just a little bit. At least a, at least a little bit. All right, there you go. Um, this little six pounder over here gets to be the first, you know, the only sort of independent gun. This is probably not the best sighting 
I probably should have put all my artillery over here, but you know, what's done is done. Uh, and again, I expect that we might exchange a couple of volleys and then the enemy will withdraw. So let's find out. Yep. Just as I suspected. I might, however, because I have an hour, I might be able to capture some of their guns. And you know how much I like to eat rebel guns. It's my favorite meal. Well done, Mr. Wallace. Tidbull I'm less impressed with. <laughs> there we go. Okay, that's two guns, or two batteries, taken. That's pretty great. I'm just going to let the time wind down. Have the band strike up some John Brown's body. All right, there we go. Well, I took 35 of their 50 guns. That's an accomplishment. All right, another uh, dubious victory at Grenada. Now I'm paranoid that I'm actually mispronouncing Grenada as well. Is it Grenada? Grenada? I don't know. It's Missouri. I mean, it's Mississippi, not even Missouri. I don't know. Somebody who knows, feel free to let me know. Um, all right, so I believe for now, most of the leadership shifting around has been done. Uh, we're still waiting for Hooker to arrive, so let's zip through some time. Sioux Uprising. So this is a real thing. This is, an, uh, this is absolutely a real thing. So if, just to illustrate that there are many United Stateses, there are many Americas is probably a better way to uh, talk about it. So the, the the newspaper thing on this is relatively accurate. Um, you know, it's it's describing a, a hunting party of Dakota men killed five white settlers in Afton Township, Minnesota. Uh, and Chief Little Crow has attacked the Lower Sioux, also known as Redwood Agency, killing Andrew Merrick, among others. Um, so this happened, and this did happen in the summer of 1862, and this was responded to with pretty overwhelming force by the United States Army. And it led to Abraham Lincoln ordering the hanging of more than 30 Sioux men. This was the largest mass execution in American history. So if you were to ask a person of indigenous descent in the United States about what they think about, about Abraham Lincoln, one of the things they might not think about right away is the fact that, you know, he's the great emancipator. He's the guy that ended slavery, right? That's And that's what sort of a lot of American school kids brought up in, like, the American public schools would tend to assume if they were born around the same time I was, right? That's, that's what I knew about Lincoln from school. Um, but I didn't find out about, you know, the Sioux Uprising and the mass hanging until college. And I'd never heard of it. And... So when you when you might be talking to somebody with indigenous descent in their background or or who grew up on a reservation or who is more inundated with Native American history than a lot of white kids like me were, their memory of Lincoln may not be so favorable. Uh, and if you encounter that without really knowing the background of the Sioux uprising and the execution, that might come across as like really weird, right? Um, but yeah, it was, it was hideous. It was, it was awful. Um, this was a whole, it's a whole thing. Um, so yeah, there's, I'm one of the things I appreciate about this game. Um, and I'm toying with the idea of doing a sort of larger kind of, uh, 
not review necessarily, but something like a video essay about Civil War games. Because Grand Tactician is, I think, one of the very few that even acknowledges the fact that slavery is the sort of omnipresent center of the conflict, right? Like a lot of its policies revolve around slavery. A lot of its game mechanics revolve around slavery. If we're playing a CSA campaign, when we're thinking about where to put buildings and how productive they are, slavery is a thing that is part of that in the background. It's part of the math of the game. And if you were to play a similar game, something like Ultimate General Civil War, you could play the entire game, the entire game, and not come across a single reference to slavery. Which I think is, excuse my language, fucking nonsense. I think that is lost cause propaganda. And I, I'm not going to say, like, I don't, I'm not saying that people shouldn't play the game. Or that if you really enjoy the game that you're wrong or a bad person or nothing like that, right? Like, it's entertainment. You can take your entertainment however you like. But, to me, I have, I have a master's degree in American history. And the idea that you can make anything, even if it's made for entertainment, that is about the Civil War without acknowledging slavery in any respect is, is just absolutely abhorrent to me. And so I really appreciate that Grand Tactician has this stuff in here, right? Like this might be the only time you ever see anything about the Sioux Uprising and mechanically there's nothing we can do about it. I can't role play as Lincoln and forgive these guys and not have the largest mass execution in American history. Um, and, you know, uh, this, this little newspaper here is probably a little bit more gratuitous than it probably needs to be. But the fact that they even mention it is over and above the vast majority of Civil War games out there, and I think it deserves some credit for that. That said, it's an astonishingly low bar. One of the more popular Civil War games that's out there right now is literally called War of Rights. And again, you can play through the entire game. You can play hours and hours, hundreds of hours of the game and very likely not come across any reference at all to slavery or black people in general. And it, like that to me is just, it's propaganda. It's propaganda. It is lost cause propaganda. And I might be persuaded if I'm not losing subscribers by the minute here to, to do something like a video essay about sort of the state of Civil War games as it stands now. Uh, because it's something that I care about a lot. It's something that I'm really interested in. Like I teach American history in college and I know that a lot of students play video games and that's how they learn a lot of their history. That's how they're exposed to a lot of history. And if video games are out there selling a version of the Civil War that is removed from the central political question of the American Republic prior to 1862, it's, it's, it's pure propaganda. You might as well be playing a KKK game. And I know, like, uh, I'm being a little strong and a little exaggerated here, but, like, it's something, again, I feel very strongly about. And it's one of the reasons... It's honestly... Playing, Grand, or playing Ultimate General Civil War is what made me start researching the Civil War more intensely. Because when I played Ultimate General, I, I was playing a Confederate campaign... And I had been expecting some sort of mechanical difference between operating the sort of, you know, that little, I don't even know how to describe it really, the, the economic mini game in between battles, right? Like you can raise the number of brigades and you can buy different weapons and stuff like that. And I was thinking that like, oh, it'll be neat to see how the fact that rebel officers had enslaved servants and how the army impressed enslaved workers to build field fortifications and to manage supply line and like to do a lot of the labor that in the union army was done by soldiers it'll be interesting to see how they how that manifests in the game and it didn't at all it was exactly the same they are it's it's it was a version like the fact that they didn't acknowledge that at all was like weird to me so i went out and looked for books that were about how the rebel armies used enslaved labor through the course of, of pursuing the war. Um, and it led me to a really great book. It's called Marching Masters by Colin Edward Woodward, which is all basically about the, the, the way in which slavery and slaveholding and using enslaved workforce 
cooperated with and was used by the rebel armies and the rebel rebel politics and everything. And from there, I started reading a lot more about the Civil War. This happened a couple of years ago. So uh, I my master's degree is in the War of 1812, much earlier, obviously, than the Civil War. And so, like, my exposure to Civil War stuff probably has a lot of uh, a very different vector than most people because I didn't really start being interested in the battles and stuff like that. Like, I'd seen Gettysburg of what and whatnot, of course. But my interest was in the sort of social and cultural aspects of the war before it was in the mechanics of warfare. Um, and anyway, that's a long diatribe. I'll chapter this so you can just skip right along my <laughs> anti-slavery abolitionist propaganda, uh, if you like, and get back to the battles and stuff. But all of this is to say that I really appreciate the fact that Grand Tactician has this stuff in there because a lot of other games just wouldn't. And nobody would notice the difference because of the state of Civil War gaming. And that, that's all I have to say. Um, so going back to it, right, I'm just going to black the screen out. We're going to wait for Hooker to arrive in theater, and then we'll take a look at some other stuff. All right, never mind. Um, it's going to take way longer, way longer for, um, for Hooker to arrive in theater than I thought. Um, and thanks to some weird stuff... So we've got Stone's army, 6,000 men against the department. Now I'm going to withdraw. Um, I have to withdraw. There's, there's, this is so weird. Okay, so I have to go fight this battle over here in the east. Okay, I still want to wait until Hooker arrives to really start doing anything major over here, but I've had to do a lot of weird stuff. <laughs> to get this, uh, get everything moving. Um, had a couple of bounce battles over here. Um, and I've got more attempted uh, amphibious landings back behind my Army of the Potomac and Shenandoah and whatnot. So I will again return. Alright, Hooker is finally on the rails. He's riding all the way down here to Bowling Green. Got some armies again bouncing around. Um, but as that is going, let's take a look at some of the buildings that just completed. So we just built a lumber mill. The Hillsdale Lumber Mill just completed. Let's take a look. Okay, uh, it is producing 202,000 pieces of lumber. That's pretty great. Uh, we should also have some mills that I believe were put up nearby. Yep, the Pontiac Mills. So, it is taking 55,000 pieces of crops and turning it into 18,000 pieces of flour. Let's take a look at our economy alerts. Crops are still lower than demand. Flour is way lower than demand. Wow. Food production is gaining. Leather production's way down. Niter production's pretty low. Rice production is close to demand. Wool production is far, far below. It looks like the most gains we've made is iron production. The demand is 293,000, and we've got about 223,000. So I think upgrading more of my iron mines is going to be a pretty good thing in the long run um and wood production we just went up so we're almost we're almost close to where we we're, we're almost at where we need to be in terms of lumber pr production so subsidy funding four and a half million and i've got 12 million so i'm going to go for it we're going to immediately upgrade the lumber mill there and let's take a look at more iron mines Marquette Iron Mines are both upgraded. Aztec Copper Mines still cost a billion dollars to upgrade. Um, I cannot upgrade the Superior. Oh, it is being upgraded. Okay. And then Duluth Iron Mines. So I still have the subsidies. So I'm going to go for it. Why not? I've already spent the money. And I, I definitely need the iron. So yeah, let's go for it. Um, and then lastly, let's check on our pal over here. Hey, look at that! The Chicago Foundries are finally turning a profit. All of our efforts were not in vain. We're doing it. <laughs> the, 
That's actually... Oh, that's... I... Honestly, that's the first time I've ever actually made a... a, a uh, like an individual company like that just like turn a profit all of a sudden. That's cool. Um, it's good to know that... Uh, the, the, you know, what little I know about the economy <laughs> and how it operates in this game and in real life... Uh, actually had some some benefits here in the campaign. That's pretty cool. So obviously we still have quite a few other companies that are not turning a profit. So if we, you know, they're foundries, the same thing. So if we look at this, uh, it is matching 2.4 to 2.4. So hopefully with the larger scale changes that we've been making, producing more iron, producing more copper, trying to get the transportation infrastructure a little bit more set, it seems like that's having an effect. It's having a slow effect, but it's having an effect. Um, and that's that's really cool to see, especially since like foundries so often start very poor in in their profits versus their costs. And it's nice to see that that actually turns around. Um, so here we've got the mill. Free goods, 167 million, and the produced goods are 160. So we need more crops because it turns that turns it into flour huh so i wonder if i upgrade some more farms around some of our mills we might start turning a profit with those as well although this one is apparently doing just fine and i think it probably more placement than anything it's right next to a level two farm so this transportation stuff is like non non-existent here at all but that's that is pretty neat um yeah, so we'll. What about this guy? He's about a hundred thousand below, but he, he. This is a produces a lot less. But I think with these upgraded iron mines that are that are going to be churning out here in a, in a moment, um, I bet that'll turn profitable soon too. Well, in any case, that's that's economy, and we're still going to wait until Hooker arrives. So let's just zip through the time here, and um, should I even bother? This is just going to be another withdrawal. Um, and once again, just, you know, this is sort of bizarre because we are literally, this, this, these armies have not moved. They have not moved in like months, in weeks in game time. They have not moved. And yet we are fighting on different battlefields every time we start this battle. So again, I very seriously doubt we're actually going to be doing any fighting. I'm just going to press play. We're going to exchange some fire. And they're going to withdraw. See? What a giant waste of time. I would honestly be a little bit less annoyed. No. Uh, they just... They can't keep doing this. It's so... It's so annoying. And I, I like... You know, it's not like game-breaking or anything like that. It's just... Annoying. And I don't think there's anything that I, as a player, can do to stop it. And, like, I can't... I'm not going to take the risk of auto-resolving auto the army. Because it's, it's very likely going to just lead to a lot more casualties than I would otherwise take. And a lot more aggravation. And it's just... You know, it's pointless. Once again, victory at Grenada. So, I think I've changed my mind. I'm not going to wait for Hooker to arrive. Because I feel like if I continue advancing time by 50, I'm just going to have to fight... Quote-unquote, fight this same battle another 13 billion times so i'm not i'm gonna start the next episode with hooker's arrival uh and i'm gonna once he arrives i can try to sort this out into a little bit less clutter but i've complained a lot in this episode about this but like the fact that they have so many armies that are like five thousand men or fewer is unbelievably aggravating i don't know what they're doing um and I wish they would not do what they're doing. <laughs> However, we have had a couple of triumphs. We've had some interesting discussions. We've had a couple... We've had at least one good battle, I think. I can't remember now. And 
um, we had some uh, economic triumphs. So that's pretty cool, uh, all things considered. And uh, thank you for watching once again. Leave a comment if there's anything you'd like me to take a look at. And uh, otherwise, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.